get going. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Good, good yes. evening and welcome. Welcome to uh, tonight's webinar here called Entrepreneurs, How to Clear the Blocks Your Abundance. Now, if you're having a good hair day over there, please pop your video on. You know, I really, it would be good to see you and interact with you. So um, just to give you a bit of background in terms of um, who I am. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lee Rubik. And I am an abundance coach, but my specialization is around mindset. I was trained at the so-called Harvard of Professional Speaking Schools in July 2014. Uh, it's called the Bill Gove Speech Workshop in Boston. And what is it that I do? Uh, I help entrepreneurs remove money blocks and attract clients easily. And I work with entrepreneurs from all around the world and these business persons are experiencing quantum leaps in the results because of the ideas that we teach the ideas that we're going to be running uh, here tonight so once again uh, if you can i'd like to encourage you to please uh, pop your video on uh, so that i can see uh, see you and engage with you that would really be great um okay so this is what I'd like you to take away from tonight's presentation for your time invested here. Firstly, I'm going to show you what the root cause of your current results are. So whether you're talking the amount of money you're earning, your business results, uh, your relationships, your health results, I'm going to show you what the root cause of that is and then explain how to change it. Secondly, I'm going to introduce you to the three different income earning strategies. Now, there's only three ways that you and I can earn money. I'm going to show you what they are and then suggest which is the best one to use. And then thirdly, I'm going to give you a strategy to turn your annual income into a monthly income. Now, I'm hoping where you sit in or stand in or whatever you're doing in front of the screen, that you'd agree with me that these are fairly important ideas we're going to be covering over the next 45 minutes. So what I want you to do is really encourage you to set all distractions aside, turn your phone upside down, um, you know, close the door, get a notepad and pen out, because I promise you, and I'm going to give you my very best in this next, in this hour, I promise you these ideas that we're going to run through can literally change the rest of the course of your life. So to get us going, I'd like to tell you a story uh, about my mentor. The man on your screen here is a man by the name of Bob. Uh, Proctor. If you are familiar with the name, if you are familiar with Bob uh, Proctor, please drop a number one in the chat if you are. Now, I was personally mentored by Bob Proctor since December 2016. Bob passed away in February last year, 2022. But way back in 1961, Bob was a fireman in Toronto. And as a fireman in Toronto, he was earning $4,000 a year, that was his annual income, which is probably an average average annual income in 1961, and he owed $6,000, and when he used to retell the story, he said, you know, his days was filled with trying to get creditors off his back, he says he was in an impossible situation, when he used to retell the story, he said if he had worked for a whole year and a half just to repay debt, he'd have nothing to live on. And during his time at the fire station in a suburb called East York in Toronto, during his time at the fire station, there was a man who used to come around, a man by the name of Raymond Stanford. And Ray obviously seen something in Bob Proctor. He took a liking to him. And one day he decided, I'm going to wake this man up. And he said to Bob, he said, Bob, you got to be one of the most miserable people that I've ever met. And Bob says, you know, as much as that was a shock and it stung him, he had to admit that what this man was saying was true. He wasn't a very happy person. And secondly, Ray said to him, you always seem to be sick. You're always coming down with something. You don't have any terminal illness, but you always seem to have a headache or cold or sniffle. Or something's up with you. And once again, Bob had to admit this man was stating the truth what was obvious. 
And thirdly, Ray said to him, you never seem to have any money. And like I said already, the man was earning 4,000. He owed six. And then Ray said to him, do you think I'm a happy guy? And Bob had to admit this guy who always had a spring in his step. He was always upbeat, always high energy. He was enthusiastic. So Bob had to say to him, you know, yes, I, I think you're a pretty happy guy. And then Ray said to him, have you ever seen me when I was sick? And Bob once again had to admit, never seen this man when he was ill. And thirdly, Ray said to him, have you ever seen me when I was broke? Now, Bob Proctor says this is the one thing that grabbed his attention most about Ray Stanford. This man always seemed to have a roll of cash on him. And Ray said to him, he said, your way is not working. It's not working. Clearly, it's not working. Why don't you try my way? And then he gave Bob a copy of this book. The book is called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He gave Bob a copy of this book and he said to Bob Proctor, I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions. Uh, the, one of the first suggestions he gave Bob was to write an income goal on a card to write the amount of money he'd like in his possession. And the very first goal Bob set in 1961 that he got onto his card was he wanted to earn, or he wanted $25,000 in his possession. Now, if $4,000 was an average annual income, $25,000 back then was a lot of money. In fact, Bob said he didn't know anybody that had $25,000. And, um, you know, this is my goal card. This is what I'm going to achieve. This is the direction I'm heading in. And so Bob had the goal of 25,000. He followed Ray's instruction. And Ray said, what I want you to do, this book, Think and Grow Rich, I want you to read a little bit from this every day. He said, you know, the man, Napoleon Hill, he, uh, he took 25 years creating this philosophy, analyzing, studying 500 of the world's most effective individuals in the early 1900s, amongst them guys like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller, um, Woodrow Wilson, who was one of the US, ex-US presidents, um, Alexander Graham Bell, F.W. Woolworth. I mean, just a lonely, laundry list of successful individuals. And he said, you know, it took 25 years to create this. I think it would be a prudent move on your part to spend the rest of your life trying to understand what this man packaged here. And then Ray proceeded to say to Bob, if you read a little bit of this every day and you follow the suggestions I'm going to lay out, you can have anything you want. And Bob says there is no way that he could have believed what this man was saying. Like, I just got to write an income goal on a card. I've got to take this book and read a bit from it every day and I can have anything I want. He says there's no way he could believe that. But he said this man, Ray, Ray Stanford, said it with such conviction that he didn't believe it, but he believed Ray believed it. And for some strange reason, he done exactly what Ray asked him to do. And within one year, Bob grew his income from $4,000 to $175,000. Within a year, he multiplied it by 43 and three quarters. And within five years, he took it over a million dollars. Now, you might be asking, you know, what did he do? Because he wasn't focusing daily on getting creditors off his back and focusing on debt, and he was focusing on this income goal of $25,000, he started hearing people talking about the earning of money. And someone said, it's good money cleaning floors. He said, you know, I'm not a proud guy. I'll clean floors. So he got a couple of buckets and a couple of mops, and he opened an office cleaning company. So that's how he grew his income. He, he opened a business. Now, his life changed so dramatically in that first year that all he'd been doing since then is teaching these ideas and concepts that we're going to run through here tonight to individuals all around the world. And Bob has literally, before he passed last year, he's impacted millions of lives around the, the world. And in all of that research, 61 years, he found that people just generally have three lifestyle desires. Now, I want to ask you if you can relate to these desires. Firstly, people just want to be free from any financial concerns. 
Now, contrary to popular belief, most people don't want the lifestyles of the rich and famous, right? In fact, most people don't want the responsibility that comes along with that. But I think most people want enough for that cocktail dress or for that tailor-made suit or, you know, um, enough money for that trip they'd like to take or, you know, always a buck tucked away for whatever it is that you want. You know, no debt worries. So people want to be free from any financial concern. Secondly, in all of that research, he found that people who just like to wake up every day enthusiastic about how they're going to spend their days. In other words, your work, your vocation. Do you know that there was a survey done by a very reputable organization and they found that 80% of people are waking up every day. They travel in an hour in traffic one way, an hour in traffic the other way in the evenings, afternoons, and they're going to jobs that they dislike, 80%. I mean, that's a scary number, right? And then thirdly, Bob found that people who just like to wake, enjoy daily relationships with other men and women who are enthusiastic, upbeat, and creatively productive. So in other words, positive people, you know, people want to rub sh shoulders with, with those kind of individuals. Now, I want to ask you, can you relate to those three things? If you can, drop a yes in the chat. If you can relate to those three things, drop a yes in the chat. So Marie can. Teresa can. Debbie. Now, Nalin. Nalin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Nalin. Um, now, that seems like a good way to live, right? And yet not many people live that way. And those three things we've run through, that's not a large demand to place on life. It's not. You are God's highest form of creation. There's nothing on the planet that will equal you. I mean, we've been told that you've been created in God's image, right? God being the creator, you've been given creative faculties. And through the effective use of these higher mental faculties, those three things, that's not a large demand to place on life. But here's the thing. Most people are not using these higher mental faculties. In fact, most people cannot articulate what they are. I'm going to lay them out for you. You've got six higher mental faculties. You've got your will. Will is what gives you the ability to focus. You've got your imagination. The imagination is the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably powerful force that the world has ever known. Everything around you, your house, you know, the computer in front of you, that phone. I mean, you name it, your camera, whatever it is, the car. All of it was created in someone's imagination first before we had it on the material plane. Number three is your intuition. That's your inner guidance. Sometimes you just know, right? Then you have your perception. Number four, that's your point of view. If you can see why something cannot be done, change your point of view and you might find um, a way to do it. Or look at it from the point of view of someone who, from someone who's accomplished that feat already. Number five is your faculty of memory. And number six is reason. And reason is what gives you the ability to think. Now, through the effective use of these six higher mental faculties, you can literally create your own economy. Now, I know that could sound like a cute line. So I'll qualify this. There were people in the Great Depression of the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s that were making millions. They did not buy into the mass consciousness of lack. Um, there were people during the pandemic, some people closed their businesses. Other, others were thinking creatively and their businesses exploded during the pandemic because they were thinking, they were using these higher faculties and thinking differently. Now, everyone wants freedom, and I think that's why you joined us online here tonight. Everyone wants time and money freedom. Now, what were we talking about in those three points? It's time and money freedom. You know that most people don't have time freedom, and most people don't have money freedom. You'll be amazed at the amount of free time you have if you never have to worry about money. 
Now, I want you to mentally think of your own results for a moment. I want you to think about what's the most you've ever earned in a year. Then I want you to think about your work or the business you're in, how you spend your days. And then I want you to think about four or five people that you spend a lot of time with. And then we've got to ask ourselves, you know, did I meet the criteria that just that was laid out there? You know, and think of your results. And then we've got to ask ourselves, you know, how do results happen? Do results just happen? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, before I got into any sort of personal development or mindset development, I used to think results just happened to me. Whether it was the amount of money I was earning or relationship challenges or whatever was coming along, I just thought it was happening to me and I was dealing with it as it came along. I've since changed my mind on that. Your results are not happening to you. They are proceeding through you. So I don't think results just happen. So let's take a closer look at results and how they do happen. And as we go through this, once again, and I know I keep coming back to it, but once again, I want you to reflect or think on your results. Marie, I want you to think about what you're currently earning. Debbie, I want you to think about how you spend your days. You know, the work you do. Anthea, I want you to think about the people that you spend a lot of time with. And then we've got to ask ourselves, how did this happen? You know, how did I settle for this income? income? Did I in fact settle? Or did someone else decide this is what I was going to earn? Or was it an intentional decision? You know, this is this is what I'm going to earn. How did I get to earn this income? Uh, how did I get into the work I'm doing? You know, did I stumble into it? Did somebody say, you know, there's good money working down at the factory or there's good money at, or did you discover your passion? Uh, you know, what you maybe feel is aligned with your purpose or, you know, you, you love helping people and you discovered this and it was intentional that this is the work you're going to spend the rest of your life doing. And then how did you get to mix with all these people? Have you just been doing it for so long that you figured... That's just the way it is. Now, there's only two things you need to know to build your business, to grow your mediation business, your firm. Two things. Firstly, you've got to know where you are. And secondly, you've got to know where you're going. And then you've got to start heading off in that direction. I'm going to back up. Only two things you need to know to build your business, to grow your income. Firstly, you got to know where you are. You got to take a real hard look at your current results. And then you got to know the star you're shooting at. And then you got to start heading off in that direction. Now, that seems so simple and so obvious. We've got to ask ourselves, why are so many people stuck? Now, I used to think that the problem was up here, that the problem was with goals. People didn't have a star that they were shooting at. This is also something I've changed my mind on. People might not have a clearly articulated goal written down on a card that they carry with them, but I think most people want more. Most people might, you know, want a bigger home or a nicer, a more luxurious car or to take that trip or, um, you know, to send the kids to the best school. But everybody, I think everybody wants more. So the problem is not up there. The problem is down here. It's with where you are. And where you are has got to do with paradigms. I want you to ask yourself, can you get up and talk intelligently for five or 10 minutes on paradigms? You know, how is a paradigm formed? How does it affect our life? How do you change a paradigm. Now, the answer to that is no. And it could well be, you know, that you can't get up and talk intelligently for five or 10 minutes on paradigms. You have absolutely no idea how it's impacting your life. You know, Rhonda Byrne produced this hit runaway movie that Bob Proctor was a part of in 2006 called The Secret. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the movie. 
And it reached a half a billion people around the world, 500 million people. And it perpetuated this idea that you just need to think something on a conscious level and you've got it. If what you want is not in harmony with your paradigm, I promise you, you're never going to get it. So let's go deeper with paradigms. What's a paradigm? A paradigm is a mental program that is stored in a section of your subconscious mind that has almost exclusive control over your habitual behavior. And get this, almost all of our behavior is habitual. Now, if you stop and think, there's a routine from the time you open your eyes in the morning until you close them at night. And if you live with someone, you could probably set a clock next or, you know, time them. They wake up at the same time every day, you know, whether they grab the TV remote or the coffee mug or the toothbrush first thing in the morning. There's kind of a pattern that they fall into and God beware your soul if you get in the way of their pattern, right? Now, this pattern wakes us up and it takes us all through life. You know, just to reflect back on what Bob Proctor done way back in 1961. So he started this cleaning business. He took his income to 175 in a year. Uh, over a million within five years. And he expanded that company from Toronto to Montreal to Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, London, England. So three different countries, six different cities. And he was busy set, setting up shop in London and he's sitting there and he's earning in excess of a million and he's asking himself, how did this happen? Like, what happened here? Because he was raised with the popular beliefs that probably you and I were raised with that if you're going to make a lot of money, you got to be really smart. Or, um, you know, if you're going to do well in business, you've got to have a good formal education. Bob knew he wasn't very smart, and that's his own words. And he also, he, he had no formal education. He had three three months high schooling. So what, we, what the ideas he was sold, that wasn't true. And, you know, digging a bit deeper, what he realized was he actually shifted this paradigm in his subconscious mind. So let's look at what paradigms are exactly. Paradigms are a multitude of habits, a multitude of ideas, and get this, they are other people's habits that are passed on from one generation to the next. Now, once again, this is something I will qualify. Why do you like the kind of food that you like? Because that's the food your parents liked, and that's what you were given, right? Why did they like that kind of food? Because that's the food their parents liked, and that's why, what they were given. You know how far back in the family tree you'd have to go to see who made some of the decisions for us to do some of the things we're still doing today. So let's park paradigms for a moment. We'll come back to it. I want to show you the three different income earning strategies now. Only three ways we can earn money. We refer to it as M1. M2 and M3. Now, if you've got any young kids at home, you want to make sure you are teaching them the M3 strategy because our school schooling system is not going to teach our kids how to earn money. I promise you that. Um, somebody could come out of the best university in the world with an honors degree in economics and still not know how to earn money. Um. If our schooling system, if the teachers, professors, lecturers, if they knew how to earn money, they'd be wealthy, right? You can't give what you don't have. So they can't transfer any. They don't know how to do it. M1 is used by 96% of the world's population. And I want you to see this is we speak into the program, into the paradigm again. And 96% of the world's population is using M1 because that's how we were programmed to earn money. Our environment, our schooling system teaches us to trade out time for money. Now, this is a losing strategy because it has an inherent problem. And the problem is saturation. You only have X amount of time in a, in a day, in a week, in a year, in a month, in a lifetime, right? You only have X amount of time. Eventually, you run out of time. I don't care if you're a neurosurgeon earning 20000 an hour. There's still an inherent problem, and it's called saturation. 
Now, some people squirrel some money away using the M1 strategy, and they break out to the M2 strategy. And then M2 is used by only 3%, and for good reason, once again, because most people don't just have money lying around to earn money. Some people squirrel some money away using the M1 strategy. They break out into the M2 strategy. They start playing the stock market, investing in Bitcoin or crypto and um, Forex, whatever it is. They don't know what they're doing and they end up losing their money. If you're currently using the M2 strategy, you want to make sure you've got some really smart people looking after the money. Now, M3 is where I suggest you focus your attention. From, from this point moving forward, it's used by 1% of the world's population. And that 1% is earning 96% of what's being earned. And that's where you multiply your time by setting up multiple sources of income. Now, I've never, ever been part of any network marketing organization, but my belief around network marketing or MLM is it's ushering in the new economy because it's 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 a business that with a relatively small initial investment you can get into which allows you to set up multiple sources of income now at the Procter Gallagher Institute we can show you how to turn your annual income into a monthly income now I know once again this could seem like a cute line or there's someone in the audience, one of you are sitting there, at least one of you, and you're thinking, yeah, right. Annual income into a monthly income. And I know this because a number of years ago, I was in a seminar room in Toronto and Bob Proctor's on stage. And this very slide is up there. And he's saying to us, we can show you how to turn your annual income into a monthly income. And I'm sitting in the audience and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. But let me tell you a story. I came into this business I'm in, and I want you to look at the timing of this, right? I came into this business full-time on the 1st of October, 2019. And to say that was scary would be an understatement because I've got two households that are depending on me to provide. I've got a little boy and probably like you, I take that, you know, the responsibilities very seriously. So it was scary, but... I went through the fear anyway, and I came into this business that I'm passionate about. And when I came in full time, I belonged to a business network called BNI. It's the world's largest uh, networking organization, Business Networking International. It's, in fact, it's where I met Teresa late. Um, if you're familiar with BNI, drop a yes in the chat if you are familiar with the organization. So we have an area director. We had an area director at the time, uh, Liesel Janssen van Rensburg. She's still the area director. So Marie's familiar with BNI. and um, An area director here on the West Strand by the name of Liesel Janssen van Rensburg. And I asked Liesel, I said to Liesel, you know, after I came full-time into the business, I said, Liesel, can you give me three suggestions on how to really get this business network moving for my business now? Because I said to her, look, it's make or break. And she gave me three suggestions. She said, firstly, I'm going to see if we can get you onto the speaker program for our International Networking Week event in February 2020. Secondly, she said, I want you to visit another BNI chapter. So there's all these chapters set up all over the world, groupings of business owners. She said, I want you to visit another BNI chapter outside of your own. And thirdly, when you add those chapters, look for members you resonate and set up a one-to-one -one with them. And when you're sitting down with them, having a chat, getting to know them, try and find a way to help them. Those were the three suggestions she gave me. So anyway, she managed to get me onto that speaker program for the International Networking Week event on the 4th of Feb, 2020. There were 400 people in the auditorium that morning. So some really nice exposure and visibility. I was visiting another BNI chapter outside of my home chapter every week. And I was having a ton of one-to-ones. Uh, I think, um, you know, Teresa and I were both in the chapter around that time. And some weeks I was up to eight one-to-ones. Like I was really working the system. And here, March 2020, boom, the pandemic hits and we go into hard lockdown here in South Africa. Now, to be real honest with you, the first 
couple of months to stuff. I was pulling from all over just to keep the boat afloat. But what I started doing, because we were confined to our homes, instead of spending an hour on my mindset every day, I was spending two hours. And I really went online like this. And I served audiences all around the world. You know, I was just putting value out. I was just trying to serve audiences. And then one day, our chapter president, um, Ashley Svensson, he messaged you. We WhatsApp our group um, a presentation in what was called the BNI Business Booster Series, a presentation by the, a lady by the name of Anna Choi. Now, this was um, a webinar series that um, B and I were running during the pandemic. And I hopped on, I watched the lady's presentation, and I thought, you know, she gave some value, but I thought I could maybe match her for value or maybe exceed it. So I reached out to the host of that particular webinar, Claire Sherman, and I offered to do a presentation for B and I in that series. I done a presentation for them on the 18th of August, 2020. There were about 265 people online. And after being so petrified of walking away from my full-time employment in 2019, I made my entire 2019 annual income in one month in 2020 in some of the toughest economic climates. Now, I'm not sharing that story to impress you, but rather to impress upon you what's possible when you shift your paradigm. And Teresa was around then, you know, I'm, she can vouch for it. I mean, you remember the thank you for closed business. I was putting in weekly, weekly, weekly. I mean, it was just clocking up. It was just moving. So how do you do that? How do you turn your annual income into a monthly income? You do that by setting up multiple sources of income. As far back as the ancient Babylonians from biblical times, all wealthy people have had multiple sources of income. We don't want to give our age away here, but who remembers the show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous with Robin Leach? Teresa remembers it. Anyone else? Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. It aired um, from the mid-1980s, I think, to the mid-1990s. Well, anyway, Robin Leach on that show is to interview all these wealthy people from all around the world, like the ultra successful. And Bob Proctor was interviewed on, on the show as well. And Bob says, you know, in between the takes, so when they were recording, there was some time in between to shoot the breeze or to have a back and forth conversation. And he said, Robin Leach said to him, you know, out of all of these successful people that I'm interviewing, none of them seem to be busy. Now, don't you find that strange? And I want to show you the strength of the paradigm here. We were taught that you go to work to earn money. Working is the worst kind of way to earn money. You should go to work for personal satisfaction. Point two in those lifestyle desires. You go to work for personal satisfaction and you provide service to earn money. Now, with technology in this day and age, you can be providing service on the other side of the world and earning money while you're sleeping on this side of the world. I want to go through that again because it took me a while to wrap my head around it. We were taught that you go to work to earn money. Working is the worst kind of way to earn money. You should go to work for personal satisfaction. You provide service to earn money. Now, I want you to really think about this. Our world is changing. It's changing like night and day. Our world's not getting any bigger. Our world's getting smaller. You know, you're not a far away, away from anywhere in the world right now. And you can commun communicate with people all around the world from a device that you carry in your pocket or in your purse. You know, people call this a phone. The phone is probably the smallest part of it. Think of what you can do from this device. You can do your banking. You can do your invoicing. You can attend your Teams, Skype, Zoom meeting from anywhere in the world with your colleagues all over the place. Text. I mean, you name it. Monitor your heart rate, your sleep. And I'm barely scratching the surface here. 
And you can have business all around the world and you can literally run it off a device that you carry in your pocket. You can. Now, you might say, you know, how do you do that? How do you do that? The thing is, you become aware of how to do it. When you were learning at first how to drive a motor vehicle or to operate that car, you didn't know how to do it. You went to a driving instructor and they taught you how to operate that vehicle. When you first learned how to operate a computer, you didn't know how to do it. You went to someone who knew how and they showed you how PowerPoint worked and how all these different programs and how to operate this thing. Why do you think this thing of earning multiple sources would be any different? Just another quick story. After Bob had set up shop in London, he had come back to Toronto. And like I say, he was over a million dollars. But when he got back to Toronto, he, he signed a cons consulting contract over in uh, Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur with the Malaysian Airlines. And that consulting work required him to travel an hour, uh, once a month, sorry, once a month uh, to fly over to KL uh, to meet with these people. And he says, you know, from Toronto to Kuala Lumpur, it's a 24-hour flight, one way. And he used to say, you know, if you go any further, you're coming back. And he used to consider, uh, you know, these, this time on the plane, he used to consider it as his personal time. So what he used to do, he used to play with a notepad and a pen, and he used to play with words and numbers. And on this one particular flight to Kuala Lumpur, he wrote a one and six zeros at the top of the notepad. And then he asked himself, you know, how did I get to earn in excess of a million? And then he started thinking of some other individuals who were earning in excess of a million. And kept playing with that, you know, what do we all have in common that's obviously different from the mass, from what everybody else is doing? And what he realized on that flight was everybody, himself included, that came to mind had all set up multiple sources of income. What happened with Bob, uh, you know, I shared earlier that he was a fireman. He, op he opened this office cleaning business. Uh, he was cleaning those offices himself. He started with one. He got another one. He was up to four or five offices. He was cleaning them himself. He was working during the day as a fireman and moonlighting in the office cleaning business. And one day, he wasn't getting any sleep or any rest. And one day, out of pure exhaustion, he passed out on the sidewalk in Toronto. And he says when he came to, there were all these people around him, and they wanted to get him off to the hospital. And he says, you know, luckily, I managed to get away. But he says, when I got away, I said to myself, Bob, you're doing something wrong here. And he says it was like a voice in his head said, if you can't clean all of them, don't clean any of them. And the very next day, he put on a tie and he put on a suit and he got other people cleaning those offices. And that's how he managed to expand from Toronto to Montreal to Boston to Cleveland, Atlanta, London, England. He had set up multiple sources coming in from all over the show. Now, how do you do this? You become aware of how to do it. I want you to think about your results for a moment. You can have sources of income coming in from all over the place. From that single presentation in August 2020, I signed up new clients in the USA, in Canada, in Brazil, in the Philippines, um, in England, Scotland, uh, India. I mean, you name it. I had set up sources coming in from all over the place. Now, you might be wondering, are all those sources the same size? No. Some might be small. Some might be big. Some might, in fact, disappear. But here's the thing. They all flow into your bank account regardless of what currency you earn in, when it lands in your local bank account here in South Africa, it's converted into the South African rand. Now, that's a pretty appealing idea, right? In chapter one in Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill says, when riches begin to come, they come so quickly and in such great abundance that one wonders where it's been hiding during all of those lean years. There's another quote that I love by James Cook. He says, do just once what others say you can't do and you will never pay attention to their limitations again. I mean, if you just stop and think, how did we get into the air? 
There were two bicycle mechanics out in Dayton, Ohio, the Wright brothers. They sit in and daydreaming, brother, I see us taking flight. Engineers, universities that spent millions trying to get us into the air. Here were two bicycle mechanics that were going to do it. Their own father was a Protestant minister, said they were going to burn in hell for what they were trying to do. True, Teresa, true. How about Edison in his basement? trying to invent the incandescent light bulb. He failed over 10,000 times. His wife had probably thought, this man of mine has lost his mind. Everyone who has had a breakthrough thought a little differently. If you're going to have a massive breakthrough in your business, you've got to think a little differently. Now, here's another really smart man, Albert Einstein. And Einstein said that everything is energy and that's all there is to it. He said, match the frequency of the reality that you want, and you cannot help but get that reality. It can be no other way. He said, this is not philosophy, it's physics. Now, if everything is energy, then you have to be a mass of energy, and you function on frequencies. I mean, if you were to put your body behind an infrared camera in a totally dark room, that's how your body would show up. It would show up as a glistening, radiating, gleaming form. I mean, this energy, your body's casting off millions of cells per second. Um, you know, this energy, people call it the aura or the spirit or the energy or whatever it is you want to call it. But it can literally be photographed coming off the body. There was a, a man, I think, in the 1930s by the name of uh, Simeon Curlian. He invented a form of photography called Curlian photography, K-I-R-L-I-A-N, Curlian photography, that literally can photograph this energy coming off your body. Now, what affects this energy that's coming off you? And you can feel this from someone over a Zoom call. You can feel it, someone's energy over a phone call, um, you know, what causes the density and the, the quality of this energy? It's what you think that causes this. And this is something I'll qualify again because I know this could seem out there, but I'll qualify it. You could be sitting with your husband having a cup of coffee, having a very nice, amiable conversation. You're having a nice chat. And the next minute you say something he doesn't like. There's no change in his facial expression, no change in his body language, but you know you said something he didn't like. And then you ask him, you know, did I say, honey, did I say something that you that you didn't like? And he says, no, 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 we're all good, everything's fine, no, no. But you know you said something he didn't, he didn't like. Why is that? Because you transferred an idea to him, he got emotionally involved in it, he didn't like it, it affected this energy that was coming from him. And through this higher mental faculty of intuition, you picked up that shift in his energy. So you know you said something that he didn't like. Now, if what you think affects your energy, then it's all about the mind. In fact, it's all about your marvelous mind. So let's get back into the mind and paradigms again. In fact, let's go one step further and let's look at your mind and your paradigms. Now, way back in 1934, there was a doctor from San Antonio, Texas, a doctor by the name of Dr. Thurman Fleet. And he, was, he worked in holistic uh, health. And he said, you know, in, 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 this, in holistic health, we're treating symptoms. This man said this in 1934. He said, we treat in symptoms and until we treat the root cause, which he believed to be the mind, he said, we're only going to see temporary results. Here we are almost 100 years later, uh, later and we're still treating symptoms. People on Valium, on Prozac, on all these antidepressants, they numb in the symptoms, but they're not going to the root cause, which is the mind. Dr. Fleet stated that the mind is an activity. It's not a thing. People think the brain is your mind. Your brain isn't any more your mind than your finger or your toenail is. In psychology, you know, mind is movement or process. Uh, your brain is an instrument of your mind, yes. The brain is an electronic switching station, but it's not your mind. Dr. Fleet said no one's ever seen the mind in order to eliminate confusion and gain clarity. I'm going to draw an image of the mind. And this is the image that Dr. Fleet drew in 1934. Now we call this the stick person. Now you might look at this, see a couple of circles and a couple of lines and 
what are we playing hangman here? <laughs> What's the deal? I can honestly say this is the most powerful image I've ever come across when you really understand it and you apply it to things like goals, habits, uh, attitude, fear, uh, even selling. It's such a powerful image when you understand it and you apply it to those different areas. So I want you to really focus in here. The big top circle represents your mind. The circle at the bottom, that's your body. Now your mind is divided into two. The top half of your mind, that is your conscious thinking mind. That's where you pile the books up. That's where your faculty of memory lives in the conscious mind. Uh, it's also referred to as your educated mind. The bottom half of your mind, that's the subconscious mind. That's the emotional part of you, the feeling part of your personality. You know, a lot of people, when we think of this feeling part of our personality, we think of this physical pump in the middle of our chests. Yet the ancient and the wise Greeks, they said that the subconscious mind was the heart of hearts. And of course, the circle at the bottom, that's your body. Now, in March 2019, I was in Bob's home in Markham in Toronto, a couple of years before the old man passed. And he had over 5,000 books to research in his personal library. He had a library in the house and he, has the, he had the studio in his backyard and he had books in there as well. And he studied those 5,000 books over 61 years in there. And all of that research and study, he says this concept on your screen is the most valuable idea that he's ever learned. Now, here's the slide where we're going to bring it all together. And I want you to really look at the slide. School gave us valuable knowledge. No getting around that, right? However, school never taught us how to alter old paradigms, old programming. Therefore, we not frequently do not do what we already know how to do. And as you get older, you gather more knowledge, but you seem to be doing less. So this gap between what you know and do, it gets bigger so you've got superior knowledge in your conscious mind, inferior results on the outside, and this causes confusion and frustration. So let's look at it from a stick person point of view. And here you'll see how powerful this diagram is. Someone might go to the best universities, come out with degrees coming off their CV. They've got a ton of information, knowledge piled up in their conscious mind. But if you look at their results on the outside, the results would not demonstrate they've got all of that knowledge. They're struggling to find work. They've got degrees coming off. They're struggling to find work. They're struggling uh, in health, relationships. They're just in a bad spot. So the results wouldn't demonstrate they've got all of that knowledge. Why is that? It's because the knowledge doesn't necessarily translate into results. It's the paradigm in the subconscious that's creating 96 to 98% of our results, our perceptions, and our behaviors. We were sold a lie, folks. People told us that knowledge is power. Knowledge is no such thing. It only applied knowledge. That's where the power is. You know, Bob used to, when, when we used to go on trainings with him, he used, to, he used to say to us, you know, knowledge is only really powerful when it's carefully packaged and intelligently directed to a specific end. People gather knowledge, they go on courses, they lap up all this knowledge, but it's not directed to a specific end. Not saying all knowledge, but most of, most of you know, we think if we get another degree or that other certification, you know, then, then we're going to be in a better position. Are you using it? Are you implementing? Is it translating into behavior? Now, if we want to improve our business results, the amount of money you're earning from your practice or from your firm, if you want to improve your results in terms of health, relationships, you've got to install a new paradigm. Makes sense, doesn't it? Joel Barker, from his book, Paradigms, he said, to be able to shape your future, you have to be willing and able to change your paradigm. 96 to 98% of your day comes from a program. You know pretty much what you're going to do from the time you wake up tomorrow until you go to bed. Your day is run by this program. You have to be willing and able to change it if you're going to shape your future. So let's recap. I promised you 
three things for your time invested here this evening. Firstly, I said I was going to show you what the root cause of your current results are and then how to change it. Who wants to pop into the chat window what the root cause of your current results are? In business, in life, what's the root cause of your current results? Anybody? So Shubnam says, you can get an order picture at Rosebank Mall. Um, where is that, man? I'd, I'd like to go check that out, to be honest with you. Um, what, what, is, what is causing your, the root cause of your current results? Anybody? Old habits? Marie? Yes, yes. Very warm. What is the multitude of habits? What's it called? It's the paradigm, right? Your paradigm. Thanks, Teresa. Now, here's how you change it. Because the, the paradigm lives in the, here's a stick person. The paradigm lives in your subconscious mind, which is your emotional mind. There's only one of two ways that you shift an idea in your subconscious. One is through emotional impact. Right. Just like that. You know, it's a jolt to the system. Loss of a job, loss of a relationship, loss of a loved one. Uh, normally, emotional impacts are negative. 9-11 for the people in New York City, that was an extremely negative emotional impact. Can be positive. Uh, we had a positive one year in 1995 with the Rugby World Cup at a precarious moment in our history. Uh, but here's the thing with an emotional impact. Generally, you cannot control it. The other way for you to shift your paradigm so it's in harmony with your goal, with the business you want, is through constant spaced repetition. Over and 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 over. You know, when someone asks me, okay, so how do I change my paradigm? This is normally my answer to them. You've got to get involved in some elite level mindset coaching program combined with professional coaching over a reasonable period of time. So six months, a year. And that constant space repetition, that's how you shift what's happening in your subconscious mind. Secondly, I said I was going to, introduce you to the three different income earning strategies and which is the best one to use. Does anybody want to pop into the chat? Which is the best one to use out of the three we went through? Yes, Mark. Paradigm shift is required. You want different results? It's the only way to get different results. Thanks, Debbie, Mark. So it's M3 is the best strategy, right? And thirdly, I said I was going to give you a strategy to turn your annual income into a monthly income. And that's by setting up multiple sources of income so i've delivered on what i've promised you here tonight however there's still a problem and the problem is this it's one thing to become intellectually aware of these ideas that we've just run through here because this is not rocket science i mean these are these are easily understandable ideas but it's an entirely different ball game to put it into action and for that reason i'd like to offer you what i call a complementary breakthrough session but if there's a criteria here, you know, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, if you've got a business goal or an income goal that you've been working towards for a while and you're struggling to achieve it and you'd like my help, go and book a call. You can scan, you can use your phone to scan that QR code on your screen. It'll take you directly to my Calendly link. What I'll also do, I'm going to pop... Um, I'm going to pop the link in the chat here. If someone can please click on that link and just check if it's working, I'd appreciate that. So the link is there, the QR code. The other criteria, let's say you don't have a big vision or a big goal for your business. You're not clear on where you're going. So you don't have a star you're shooting at and you want my help to create that. You can also book a call. Click on that link, scan that QR code, and set up a time in the next couple of days for you and I to have a chat. So I'll just run through that again quickly. If you've got a big business goal, an income goal, something that you've been working towards for a while, you're struggling to achieve it, and you'd like my help, go and book a time for you and I to talk. I can help you. Or if you don't have a big vision, a big goal for your business, something that you really stepping out and trading your life for. You know, often when I sit with someone and I have coffee with them at a, a mug and bean or something, I'll say, you know, what are you trading your life for? And I can literally feel it stings them. Like, what are you trading your life for? And then I'll say to this person, I'll say, 
You better trade it for something that's worthy of you. If you're God's highest form of creation, trade it for something that's worthy of you. Whatever you're doing right now, you trade in your life for it. So trade it for something that's worthy of you. If you want help to create that goal, that vision, book a call. And I look forward to having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you and helping you to experience a breakthrough. So, Teresa, that wraps up my presentation. I see we one minute over the top of the hour. Um, what I'll do, I'll stick around for another five minutes. If anybody has any questions, if you'd like to pose any questions um, regarding the content that I've just gone through, I'll be happy to field them and do my best to answer them. Anybody have questions? You can Thank pop you. it in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Lee. I, I want to say to you, I think everybody online is glued. So I think we could have easily keep you here for another hour. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. Question. Oh, so there's a couple of comments. Say, great presentation. Thank you from Anthea. We've got Marie saying, very insightful. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Mark, says, pleasure. thanks you. Thank you for a great, awesome pre presentation. Shabnam also says, hi, Shabs, says thank you. Um, and Marie's asking, what are the costs of your sessions? So, Marie, there's different, there's different uh, packages. It literally varies. So it's from, I mean, it, it, there's entry-level programs. So there's no clear-cut answer there. You know, it depends I, I on what's a fit. I want to just say something. I mean, I, I have done the calls with Lee, and I've known him quite a while. And I must say to you, Start off with that 45-minute goal, that call. Start there. That, that is a good place because if you have a clear idea after that call what you want to do, and then Lee will also have a clear idea of what sort of program might be suitable for you. So I really want to encourage people to go and do that call. It's so worthwhile. And, and look, I mean, we might have that conversation. I, I'm of the belief that I, I want to give value. My belief is energy out equals energy in. So even that complimentary session, I'm going to serve you at a 10 out of 10 because I know whatever good I put out comes back. I know that. I'm working with Universal Lawyer. I know that. But what I'll do, I'll get a gauge or a feel whether it's a fit or not. So Marie, I mean, you'll be, you'll be getting a free one-on-one -on -one session with me. Book a time for, for you and I to talk. And you know, I, we can obviously see where you're at in terms of your business or life. And then if I feel it's a fit, if it's not a fit, then I mean, it's fine. We've had a conversation. And if there is something that's a fit, depending on where you are, then like Teresa said, I'll recommend it. Any questions, folks, regarding the content? Any questions? There's no such thing as a silly question. Hi, Lee Gert. Yeah, I just want to find out from you whether there's a possibility that this presentation can be shared with us and so, secondly wow. secondly wow very interesting and i'll definitely book a call awesome Kirt. i look forward to that conversation with you um i think teresa or teresa has recorded the session so i see it's, i think it's going to be up in the social justice portal and it will be um sent out to to you yes um, online participants of the conference that has missed out on the tickets, that's all of you will have access to this as well. Yes. Um, there was a, co co a question earlier by GV asking if it will be sent directly to people. I am not sure about that. I know for a fact it's going to go up on the website. Um, I will ask them to just pop a mail as well saying that it's available or not and how it's going to be reachable. Any questions, folks? Like I said, ask it while I'm here. There's no such thing as a silly question. Anything you're wondering about? Anything that kind of shocked you? This content stretched you, right? Yeah, I, I, I think if I have to speak for myself, and, and I heard, I've heard you speaking, spoken so many times before, and every time it's like a little bit of information overload, and then I'm going to have to go and dream on this and introspection on this again, because you have reminded me of a couple of things I think that is very, very important. Any questions from anybody else? I just, I just want to find out from you, what's your view regarding that product development phases, um, because sometimes I'm applying that to myself, 
where you start off a business, you go through your development phase, you go to your mature, maturity, and then there's the decline. I know in Vodacom, they had a strategy before they moved to the decline phase, then they come up with new developments, etc. So they just continue on the development phase. Look, I mean, obviously, you want to be continually developing uh, products or new products, depending on what market you serve. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll talk from my experience. You want to constantly be developing uh, new programs, new modalities of, of serving people. Um, but people invest a lot of time in research and development here. Here's what I'm going to say. And this is just something that's hit me now. Entrepreneurs are often focusing on the, the wrong thing. I mean, research and development, very important. But as an entrepreneur, as an SME, you got to focus on selling, man. You got to really learn how to sell. Because here's the thing, you can be sitting on the best product in the world. Nothing happens until someone sells something. Now, whether you sell in mediation, you sell in an hourly uh, rate, or you, you sell in... Um, you know, whatever it is, a, a, a battery or a carburetor or, you know, a program, whatever it is you're selling, you need to learn how to sell it first. You know, selling is, um, it's important. And um, I hope I've answered that. It's just kind of a, maybe a bit, a bit of a, a roundabout way of answering. It was a different way, but that's just what hit me. Um, Teresa Anthea asks you, how does it, how long does it generally to cha take to change your paradigm? So with the right guidance, with the right system, I'd say six months is efficient. There's a, there's a lady that I worked with last year uh, for six months. Her name is Kayleen Smallberger. She's actually, she's a chartered accountant and she was working for De Beers. But she started a network, network marketing business uh, with Zenzino, their supplement company. And she started with me, or she signed up at the end of June 2022. Uh, July, she started with the program. By November, she had grew that business 126%. So within five months, she grew her business. So she shifted a paradigm that radically. But this woman followed instruction, and she, she followed exactly what was laid out in front of her. And she grew that business by 126%, and she replaced her income at the beers, which allowed her to walk away from that nine to five and walk into this business she's passionate about. Wow. So it also, you know, Anthea, it's not, I see a lot of people take off within six months, but here's the thing also, the caveat, and I will lay, or I will put this in there. It also depends on how strong your paradigm is and how quickly you can emotionalize ideas. You know, some people, and I've seen it, you know, they work with me, even after the first couple of calls or within the first couple of weeks, it's like they accelerate, like they take off. But the thing is they get involved emotionally with ideas quickly and they move into action. Some people like myself, and I'll be honest, you, your, your paradigm is sometimes so strong, you got to work a bit harder and you got to really get involved with the repetition. But the thing is, if you left brained, like if you left brain and you're very analytical, so you know you you it doesn't it's not it doesn't come naturally or easy for you to get emotionally involved with the idea because you're not in the right hemisphere. You know, some of us operate in the left or the right, but if you operate from the left, you've got a, a blessing in that in that you're very persistent. You know, if you're a left brain individual, like I think Teresa is, her husband probably says she's very stubborn. That's the downside of it. But the upside of it, she's persistent. So if she makes up her mind, she's going to get something done. She'll run through a wall to make it happen because she's persistent. So even if your paradigm, it takes you a bit more time to overwrite your paradigm. If you are left brain, you get it done because you is hard copper. You you hard headed. You're going to you're going to shift your paradigm. I hope that answers you, Anthea. Any other questions, folks? I see it's ten minutes past. Does that answer you? Happy with that answer, Anthea? Yes, she says she's happy. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, Teresa, you want to wrap it up? I think I need to wrap it up. Um, because I, personally, I'll keep you here all night. And and like you say, I'm stubborn, hey? <laughs> <laughs> 
So once again, Lee, um, for years of friendship and for this amazing presentation, um, thank you very much. I know that there are so many people that you add value to, and I hope that the few people that are online now and the other people that you actually addressed in person on the conference, we've had great feedback as well. So thank you once again for this great presentation. Um, I hope you keep well. Hope nobody floods in Joburg tonight. Um, and have a nice evening. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Teresa. We'll chat soon. Bye, everyone. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.